Hi, this is Shauna, the CEO and founder of Fuel Talent. One of the things I have loved most in my 25-year recruiting career has always been the stories that people tell. Stories of leadership, career choices, company ideas, and team building. My inspiration for starting the What Fuels You podcast came from being curious about people's lives and wanting to help share their stories. What path brought them to this place? What decisions did they make that led to failures and successes? Who influenced those decisions and what lessons were learned along the way? I hope you enjoy the What Fuels You podcast. Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Stefan Weitz. As a longtime Microsoft veteran, Stefan held several director and senior director titles and was tasked with taking on Google and search and bringing Bing to market during his time there. Now, in addition to being a board member, author, patent holder, and father, Stefan is the CEO and founder of Jetson. Stefan founded Jetson, a probiotic subscription company, in 2019 as a way to better coexist with his multiple sclerosis diagnosis and as a way to help make 50 million Americans healthier. Welcome, Stefan. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, I loved reading about this last night, and I'm, <laughs> we're going to get into it because I'm like, gut health. Gut health. I feel like it comes up all the it time, is, but I feel like new, if, if, yoga. if there's anyone that I'm going to ask about it, it's you because I've eaten dinner with you, and I'm like, this guy eats healthy. You and Essie both. Yeah, she's the she's. I mean, even she's more than hardcore. I am. I'm a better half. She's vegan. Uh, yeah. Uh, so she's even more strict than I am. But. Yeah, but I want to learn about that yeah. because there's so many people who could benefit. Oh my gosh, so yeah. many. Yeah. And yeah. I went on the website, and I love that you have kids stuff too. Just we, launched today. Yeah. All right, we're starting with rapid fire. Great. Where is your favorite place you've ever visited? Well, I have two places I love to go routinely. One is Munich, because okay. I just love the Oktoberfest. Munchen. Munchen, exactly. And that one is uh, Hobart, Tasmania, which is way down at the bottom of the world. And I oh. go there a lot, actually. How many countries have you visited? That's not part of my rapid fire. Uh, but... Let's see. Um, SC and I together had been at like 56, I think. And I, I must have been now to like 80 in that range. That's She's incredible. been like 100 and something. I know. She's totally the overachiever in the relationship. <laughs> Well, I, you've met your match. Exactly. I mean, you guys are such adventurers. Exactly. I love it. It's fun. Um, what is your worst habit? Biting my nails. Oh, you bite your nails? All the time. I've gotten better because of the coronavirus. Well, least... I, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my hands away from my face. Maybe this is like the best cure for coronavirus. It's, it's that or that, that disgusting icky nail polish you put on. And yeah, make it I did that when I was little. But you're yeah. going to just taste Purell now. <laughs> you do it. But which I'm kind of enjoying, honestly. I, I was about to say, Purell's <laughs> actually pretty good. I, I get the flavor kind. The flavor kind, the coconut. Yeah, yeah. I, made my own, I made my own last night, actually. <laughs> I, true story, I did. I have these great essential oils, and I have Everclear, so I was making my own whiskey at one point. So I have Everclear, which is basically 95% alcohol. Oh, nice. And I have some essential oils, some tangerine and some lime. So I'm mixing up my own hand oh, sanitizer. did you bring it? No, well, I forgot you, it. Hello. But I smell great. That's half the battle is that you... <laughs> I know, but I smell great You should probably wear it. No. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, what is an app that you cannot live without? Ooh, I love Bands in Town. I like Bands in Town, yeah, that's too. That's pretty epic. Um uh, that's probably my favorite app right now, actually. Bands in Town is a yeah. good one. Um, well, okay. On that note, what was your very first concert? Bonnie Raitt. Oh. The Tacoma Dome. The Tacoma Dome. A woman who I had an infatuation with. And it was kind of a date that I, I, don't, I don't think she thought it was a date. <laughs> I mean, we were, I think at the time, maybe sophomores. So yeah. I'm not really sure it was. Uh... So someone drove you to the Tacoma yeah, Dome? Yeah, I think so. Or I don't know how I got there. There was no Uber back Well, then. I'm assuming with all your travel that you're... Yeah. Reading because I know you're not a big podcast listener. Oh, so, listener. what are you currently reading? You know, I read a ton of uh, publications. So, I, I use a thing called Pocket, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners also use. You get Pocket, which is great. Uh, and that just because of my curation. It down, oh, it's phenomenal. So, it's really a place to kind of store things to read later. So, I, I as I come across things on the web all day long, I will, uh, I will. Like I will drag just, and drop it to Pocket? Kind of, yeah. And then when, I'm, when I have time before we're taking off on a plane or if I'm sitting in a car. Even if I'm offline, I can read the articles. So they really come across from every publication you can imagine. So they're publications and not not like books. Not books. No, books, I, I, there's one I'm reading right now. The problem with my book collection is that they're all on Kindles. And I'm not sure if you have this problem, but because you don't see the book cover every day, you, you forget, forget the about damn it. names. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell you that. There's a book I'm reading right now. It's a phenomenal book recommended to me by a great English professor. And it's about a heroin addict. And it's it's a five I, part. I don't it's know. awesome, but I can't think of the name. Okay, well, so, when you, you get go. home, I will text you. it to me. I will. Not that I'm going to read it because my problem is I do buy the books, the actual books, ah. and they're just sitting next to my 
bad. Yeah, aspirational. Ugh, it's yeah. so aspirational. aspirational. And then I end up watching like Shaws of Sunset, <laughs> like stupid ass TV. We don't have a TV in Brain, our bedroom for that reason because I think given humans are lazy, we all know that. I know. So given the alternative, should I watch Shaws of Sunset or my what was my pleasure? Succession. I watched I that love one. Succession. And that is it's basically just a soap opera with totally. better better lighting. Yeah. And better actors. Uh, so yeah, given the choice, I read a heady, you know, book uh, on on uh, Saudi in the in 1930s, or do I watch Succession? I should take the TV on a Sunday. Room. I'm watching Succession. I know. Yeah, I know. Oh God. I wish okay. I had more discipline. <laughs> What's the trait that you most value in a friend? Ooh, that's, that's a good a, one. That's right? a great question. Yeah. Tolerance. No, yeah. Well, actually, it, it probably is. <laughs> well, I was thinking with your sense of humor, like self-deprecating, yeah. that you would say, like, they put up with me. But like, what's your real answer? Uh, no, it probably is compassion. Compassion. Yeah. Just because I, I'm not sure I'm always a great friend because I, I have too many things happening, and so I'm not good at following up sometimes. So you appreciate at... low maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's a better. That's a. That's a probably more accurate. Or no, compassion pa- is a sweet word, but it's also like. It's like they get that shit they get. is going to go wrong, yeah. and that I'm going to be on a plane instead of being with them at the yeah. last minute, and and to have someone like, hey, I love you either way. Like, yeah. I get your life I'm is here, weird, and when I get, I get the choices you. you make are strange sometimes, Stefan. But you know, whatever. That's your thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this one I was curious, but usually I know the answer, and oh, on this wow. one with you, I don't know. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Ah, that's a good question. Technically, I'm an introvert. Okay, so this is why it's confusing because you have such a fun personality and yeah. contagious energy that I think sometimes that can get mistaken for an ex- extrovert. Yeah. But are you sure you're an introvert? You know, I, aren't I've you getting ta- energy right now? I've taken it so. No, this is all a big act. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I'm not. Not. not you're that trying it's false, really hard. But yeah, I have to be on. I guarantee when I leave this thing, I'll be exhausted. Oh, yeah. So you are an introvert. Yeah, I get more energy being quiet. Reading than, your Saudi uh, book. Exactly. Than than being out in public. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm right. a full extrovert, like on no, the I charts. could not even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling my husband that, like, I was exhausted yesterday, and I did two podcasts, which oh is like gosh. I'm trying to like bottle them up yeah, so yeah, yeah. that I don't have to like come here every week. Well, yeah, just so I have like a little stockpile of yeah. them. Um, and I was so energized when I left. I get energy from connecting with mm-hmm. other people. Mm-hmm. Anyway, okay. So talk to me about your. You and I are like two of the only people left that are like actually from Seattle. From Seattle, right? Yeah. But you're technically kind of not even a Seattleite right now because you're all over the world. Well, I definitely – so my daughter is here. My parents yes. are here. My siblings are mostly here. Where um, are you in the sibling? How I'm many? third. There's four of us. I'm third. You're third. I'm third. And they're all here No, my little sister is in uh, Utah. My older brother and sister are, are in Seattle. Okay. Yeah. And so you as a child, I guess, what were you into when you were little? Computers. Yeah. I read that, that you <clears throat> got into coding yeah. when you were eight. Eight. I was very, very, well, yeah, back then it was, it was pretty young. Nowadays, I get into coding in the womb. But uh, back yeah. when we were at our age, uh, eight was, was pretty young. So yeah, I, I, I was a nerd. I, I full on took briefcases to, to high school. Uh, I Really? Loved, yeah. Like yeah. a little three-piece suit and a briefcase? I, I did wear, I tried to wear a suit to high school. That is so cute. So I had, I had I had two sides in my personality. I had the I like to write code because that's my happy place, and then I also like to be in drama and be on stage, which is bizarre as well considering my introversion. So no, I had like a really full life. That's your alter ego. You're it like is Beyonce it's my, to your. I am like, like Beyonce. It's your, it's your Sasha Fierce. I am basically Sasha Fierce. You are Sasha yeah, Fierce. I am basically. And Sasha so, Fierce. did you um, do well in school? I did. Did you ever have teachers that um, really inspired you as far as thinking about what you wanted to be when you grew up? <laughs> I had such a gift. I we were. I think you were here too. I was part of the busing program in mm, Seattle. Mm-hmm. So I lived in Magnolia, and I was bused down to Franklin, which is in the south side of Seattle. Yeah, um, in Rainier, in the Rainier Beach area, or not Rainier Beach, sorry, in the Mount Baker area. Uh, and uh, so I had this gift of being with all sorts of kids that weren't that didn't look like me, talk like me, act like me. Mm-hmm. And so it was a combination of all my friends that I'd known since it was, we were in a program from kindergarten through 12th grade, all the same kids all the way through, basically. So I grew up from kindergarten to 12th with basically the same kids in my classes. And so... It was a combination of all their life experiences coming together, plus the teachers that we had in these programs. I mean, we had so many phenomenal teachers. Uh, I mean, I think of Mrs. Smith, even in drama. She was spectacular. I think of Mr. Mitchell, who was our, my advisor. And what were you into for fun? So you did drama, you coded. Were I you an athlete movies. at all? I, look at me, really? Yes. Uh, no, no I'm, I'm tall. I can play basketball, but yeah. I wasn't very good. Okay. I mean, you can. But did much... you enjoy? No, no. And do you do anything right now to stay active? I just do a lot of cardio. A lot of cardio. A lot of a lot of biking. Uh, and like a lot of Peloton. Like, like Peloton. 
Yeah, yeah. So, and I don't have a Peloton because I refuse to pay that much money for a stationary bike that I can pay three hundred dollars for on Amazon. But uh, I do ride every day, uh, even my, when you're traveling. Even when I'm traveling, you just find a gym. I find a gym. That's yeah. awesome. But I did. I made movies a lot when I was a kid. That's what I really enjoyed doing. And did you ever think that that's what you would be? Is like a movie? I thought. A movie so, director? I thought I was going to be a lawyer. So I really prepped hard. So I did coding forever, and then okay. I, I got to college. I said I can't get any women this way it's because it's, <laughs> well you went mind. to Gonzaga how'd yep. you choose Gonzaga for debate it was the number one debate school in the country back then so okay. I went to go debate there I don't want to get in a fight with you I will lose no no gosh I mean I'm not <laughs> that good at it but uh but I, I realized in in my got to school um this is back before being a computer nerd was cool right nowadays yeah. we get all yeah, the game like, I'm the we get all the game now all right? the game yeah back then you got none of the game and so yeah. I think look I'd already kind of hit my peak as far as coding I could do what I wanted to do so I shifted to kind of do law instead so debate law that whole thing so I prepped for that for so many for so long and then got to the end of uh, that that uh, experience and said actually I don't want to be a lawyer anyway and, and then went back to tech so, I'm about to tech. Yeah. And so was Gonzaga the right choice for you? Was that a good four-year experience? It was interesting. Yeah, I mean, looking back, I, had, I, mean, I had a phenomenal experience there, unbelievable. But yeah. looking back, you know, this is a one of those, as my daughter is now prepping for, for her college applications. Yeah. You know, uh, Wait, are you ahead of the game? I thought she was like a freshman. She's a sophomore. Oh, okay. So, so we're ahead of we, we yeah, went touring. We went touring. Overachievers. We, well, more like I was already in the East Coast. My kind yeah. of come out, fly out here, meet me here. We'll go to the East Coast schools. And only because the networks that people get when of they course. go to the other schools that are more, quote, prestigious, if you will. Right. It doesn't matter. I don't think the education is necessarily that much better. Uh, or it's just that you the, the networks. people the networks for and sure. so I'm trying to ex- expose to her to the fact that look go you can be a circus clown for all I care just be happy, but if you do have a desire to do X Y and Z yeah know that the networks actually pay off yeah and so, the networks and also I think surrounding yourself with people who are like minded not that Gonzaga wouldn't be this or UW where I went yeah but if you're going to a top twenty school or right. top ten school right. in theory you're around people who are passionate about learning or somehow have gotten there right. They've gotten it there depends. Somehow. I have a lot of friends who went to the top ten schools who I that they don't fall into that. Uh, I know that that thing. Well, but... when I recruited in New York, I found that I was like, yeah. "Okay, you've all gone to Ivy League schools. Half the people I interviewed, and they all some of them, it was very prescriptive since yeah. preschool, precisely. And then they graduated and didn't know how to tie the shoe, type of thing. Or, or even they just they weren't didn't, that curious. Didn't know themselves. Yeah, they weren't I, I found curious. that. And then, and we're yes. painting these ridiculous broad brushes here, obviously. Yeah. But, but anyway, no, I, so I, so I, I loved I loved where I went to school. It was amazing. Uh, I had a, and it's such a small school, which I but, really like. And you liked. studied poly science physics. Th- yeah, exactly. Bizarre. This yeah. is again, you're like left brain, right yeah. brain. I really enjoyed both everything. those things. And what did you think this was to set you up to be a lawyer? Maybe go back to law school. I was thinking lawyer at the time still, okay. but then I got to like my junior year and said, ah, I don't think I'm going to do this anymore. Yeah. And and then like, now what do I do? Yeah. And, luckily and did I Accenture had, recruit you yeah, off campus? Yeah, exactly. One of those off campus recruiting things. I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. It's I, I get to yeah. kind of explore both. I get to explore like being, I can I can drop into many companies. Yeah. I, can, I have, you know, I, I love doing 10 things at once. I'm yeah. terrible at doing one thing at once. Terrible yeah. at it. Do you have ADD? No, I don't. Oh. No. But I just am, uh, I, I am easily bored. Like yeah. once I figure out the problem. Yeah. On to the next. I, I don't really enjoy, I'm not good Saying at the guy. No, I'm, yeah. I, I've realized that about myself. I'm better yeah. at figuring out, here's a really hard problem to solve. Figure out the constraints. Figure out how you're going to manipulate these things to work. And then right. once you get there, there are people who are 100 times better than me at, at making sure stage, yeah. Yeah, to take that to 11. Where yeah. They probably couldn't do the first piece, but I, I can't do the second piece. And so Accenture, I feel like when I hear about you know McKinsey, Bain, Accenture, yeah, yeah, yeah. some of these experiences, <clears throat> yep. it's a great foundation for your career. Yeah, it was. I was there for like six months, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I got there, and and not to cast any dispersions. I have a lot of friends who who are still there, but it, to me, the the end goal of being at an Accenture or a Bain or a McKinsey was to make partner. And what I saw happening as a partner was you you became a salesperson, mm-hmm. which to me isn't fulfilling. Yeah, that's you know? not you. Not me. Like, and I. I and how did you transition to Microsoft, which ultimately ended up being a crazy, a long successful run. career? Well, yeah, I mean, it was a long one at least. Uh, I, I was I was staffed out there. And, oh yeah, and so I told they, they plucked you they out. They plucked me, which well, can't of course that did not actually happen for all the lawyers and the uh, yeah. Listening. I'm like, wow. Um, no, it was one of those things where, like, I was super young. I don't think I kind of cared yeah. that much, frankly. Uh, uh, and I said, look, I'd rather go, I'd rather go uh, join the pirates than be with the navy, which is kind of what you know, the line was my my boss used to recruit yeah. me, which was a classical Steve Jobs line from uh, yeah. when he was recruiting John Scully. So. It's perfect. And so you went there, and what was your first exposure to? Damn. Microsoft, because you, I, I mean, the way that I have it, 
um, is that kind of over the course of those 18 years, you had so many different assignments. <laughs> so many different jobs. I mean, you built yeah. e-commerce platforms. Yeah. You helped launch Bing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I had many, many things. Um, Muni Wi-Fi, Mesh Networks, MSN, Redo, uh, Windows, Office. Uh, and I mean, I, had, I, was, I was blessed again in that um, I had the ability to do every role there except for like HR because no one would hire me for HR. That's for damn sure. <laughs> uh, uh, and like finance because I'm not, I don't, I have a But how, how did you have such a successful career there? Because I've had several people on the podcast and of course have friends that are, have been there since yeah. we graduated college that right. are still there. And how, did, what would you say are the attributes of people that are successful at Microsoft? I think it kind of comes down to, and I think it's how you define success too. So I step back a little bit. I mean, I was, you could look at me objectively and say you weren't that successful because you didn't make VP or anything else. And so you, you could use that lens and say, oh, you were fine. You did a nice job, but you weren't overly successful. Or you could look at kind of the impact that you had, or you could look at how much fun and satisfaction you gained out of being at that place, right? So if you look at the first one, I wasn't that successful. I was fine, but not overly successful. Uh, the second one, the impact that I had, I would, I, would, I would put that as like an eight out of 10. Like I got to go build massive things that no one else was doing be a part of early incubations for a lot of really great products, mm -hmm. contribute to things that we still to this day use, like Zoom. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they were all, that was really, I felt like I was doing something magical. Mm -hmm. And then like fun and, and growth and getting my, practically my MBA there, you know, even though I didn't get one, I, I got one sitting there. So I was sure. with all the people who I admired so much back when, you know, I was, when I was younger. That piece, that third piece, I was probably at 11 out of 10. Yeah. Because I really did actually get exposure to so much and so many connections and so many networks and so many things outside of Microsoft that it, be, it really allowed me to take the next step in a way that I don't think a lot of people there who do follow the first path where they go from whatever PM to, to VP yeah. might not have. Right. You know? and, so, and is that because you were more of a risk taker? And, you know, before we started the pod, you were joking. Be like, oh, I was just like dumb and open to taking on <laughs> new things. But I'm like, I okay, well, what's well, the real answer? Like, did you have somebody advocating for you or mentor? I would say my first boss there, a guy named Dennis Cozart, he was this um, unbelievable Southern North Carolina boy, went, always went to Columbia as MBA from, I think it was Harvard or something like that. So a really brilliant guy, but had the great Southern accent and spoke kind of slowly. And so mm -hmm. people always so thought he was kind of a, no, people thought he was a moron because oh, yeah, we, we, we would get into a room like this and he said, look, I'm not the smartest man, but... This doesn't quite look right to me. And yeah. then someone would would try to to schmooze him or get one over on him, and then it became the most painful display of of uh, destruction you've ever seen in your entire life. As this guy's Columbia at Harbor Brain kicks in and just destroys yeah. people. Not that that was a good good trait, but <laughs> he basically early on said, "Look." I expect you to 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 create damage, not long lasting, but yeah. you should be breaking things as much as you can. Yeah. So having that permission, permission. at age twenty one, whatever it was, That's amazing. to kind of be this kid who knew nothing about anything, and was able to go do all these crazy projects and never think to myself. This could end badly. Yeah, that's a, that's a gift. <laughs> is a he still gift. is he still no, there? No, he left years ago. And is he still alive? Yeah, he is. Have you told him? Uh, I told him. Well, I don't. Nah. That might yeah, be a good thing to do. I should. He's in Arizona now, lives in Arizona, I think retired. it's kind of a cool thing to acknowledge the impact that people may have just said a sentence to you yeah. that you don't quite realize at the time was impactful. Like long term, he didn't actually succeed there because he was so, he could be so caustic and he yeah. was absolutely brilliant. And, and as the culture changed, he became a little less relevant in that sense because yeah. he was the very, very old school Microsoft. Yeah. Um, but certainly for me, that initial permission to go and be... You know, he one time he said, if I'm not getting an, an incident report on you once a week, like you're not doing your job, which wow. clearly was not, again, great advice to take. But that, but that, that, well, somehow it worked. That concept I mean, you got was your, there. What was your favorite project you worked on? Oh my God. I had so many fun projects there. Yeah. Um, I mean, Bing was fun, but that was a big, big one. The one that I think I really loved, which I, because I kind of began it from scratch, was, uh, trying to wire up. This is before 3G networks were big, before we all had iPhones in our pockets, and how to get on the network when you were not in a building with Wi-Fi was really hard, right? Remember the days back in like 2006, yeah. seven, when you didn't have a cell phone with I a never data knew connection? what people were doing because I'm not very technical, and I'd see people doing things. I'm like, I feel like I'm supposed to do that. Right, right. And so that like there was no data connection in the world. So I had this idea, what if we actually take Wi-Fi and put it outside? So we would literally wire up massive cities with mesh access points across telephone poles and create massive Muni Wi-Fi scale networks. So I had this idea, 
And at the same time, Chris Saka down at, at Google mm-hmm. had the same kind of idea, right? And so he and I would literally run across the country after each other, chasing each other to try to sign up cities to go put these networks in place. And we had to build everything, the infrastructure, the hardware, the software. And we got in, I had to go, I had to go to Bill and, and I think Steve, maybe it was Bill, and get the money for this thing. And he told me it was a terrible idea, but he gave me the money anyway. And now he, I think, still thinks he was right, even though he was right that it failed. He was wrong as to why it failed, to be very, very clear. Why uh, did it fail? It failed because the technology – well, two things happened. I, my thesis was no one in a country with the average income is $36,000 a year is going to pay 100 bucks a month per person in their family for yeah. data access. Yeah, That's yeah. what it was back in the day, right? So I thought, clearly, if I can do a free mesh network across a city, that's going to trump a cellular connection. For sure. All it, it was wrong. People did pay for that, first of all. Huh. Uh, and secondly, the technology was just really tough to get right. The thing that actually killed us, well, many things killed us, but one of the things that killed us was uh, trees. So trees are a... They were in the way. They they, are a, they absorb 2.4 gigahertz, which is the spectrum that Wi-Fi operates in. They absorb it when the leaves come out extraordinarily well. So they actually they would, they would screw up your entire mesh networks because in the, in the fall when you put the mesh networks up, everything worked great. April, May comes around, the leaves come out in the trees. Oh, interesting. Ooh, That's bad. fascinating. Yeah, lots of things. So not would, things we would be thinking not about. Not at all. The which, average Joe, which is like me. Which was fine. I, I, I worked with the mob in Detroit because they owned a bunch of the poles. I mean, literally, yeah. you, you couldn't make this this these stories Was up. there a moment at, when you were there when you were like, I've arrived? Like, I feel successful? I know it's measured by titles and by different things, but like, wow, I'm having my moment. Like, you've done a ton of speaking. You wrote a yeah, book. I mean, yeah. you've done no. some incredible things. No. I mean, I don't think I ever felt... I can tell you there are certainly times when you're on stage in front of 30,000 people or something like that and you're and you're with Steve up on stage and pitching something like that's fun and yeah. do, do I ever did I ever think wow I I've nailed it no because you do recognize especially at Microsoft any big companies like yeah. that part of the reason why I left was that you are no matter how big a deal you are you're Someone still else is a bigger deal. Well, that is yes, and you're still one piece. Yeah. Like nobody does Windows. Everyone yeah. does Windows, right? Yeah. So even if unless you're doing a teeny little project that nobody is going to really see likely you you rest kind of on the shoulders of a almost infinite resources, b mm-hmm. some of the smartest folks in the world, c colleagues that can support you and help you. So I never really felt like I did it because yeah. there were so many people around who also did it. Yeah. And so when you said that was part of the reason why I left, that must have been a difficult decision because you could have stayed. Could have stayed for a long time. Oh, gosh. Could still Absolutely. be there right now. Absolutely. And so what was the motivation to leave? It was just that. It was, I, I had come to the point where I was, I was talking to actually one of your guests earlier, Dan Levitan, who's at Mavron, and I was down talking to him and he's like, look, man, you've got two choices here, right? If, if you don't, if you stay, you're, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Basically, if you stay here, you're not going to get hired anywhere else ever again because you've been there 18 years. You'll be there 25 years. You, at that point, are a Microsoft person. People don't necessarily yeah. think that As you can recruiter, do things on your own. As a recruiter, I can tell own. you 100% right. I agree. So he's like, either get out now or be happy. You, you'll be great there. Like, crush it there, right? Yeah. And he was right. And then the other thing was... Well, also, sometimes my friends at Microsoft, if I've called them about things, and they're, like, making too much money. Well, it, that it, obscene. I mean, if it's I, obscene. I should have stayed because it stocks triple since I left. So again, yeah. all you have to do is do do what I don't do or don't do it. Either one. Yeah, don't follow me. Don't follow me. Do what I, I say, I, not what I do. I am the contraindicator <laughs> yeah. for success. So it takes a lot of courage. But it was right? less that, and it was more just I wanted to be the person that I could pin success or failure on. It's really hard when you're there to like. Again, if you're not, it doesn't matter who you are. You wanted that accountability of yeah, like, I if like, I suck, I want it to be me. Exactly. Or if I succeed, I want to be able to say, yes, I did this. So yeah. being in a smaller organization or, or, or having ultimate control, because mm-hmm. even at Microsoft, nobody, even Satya to an extent, doesn't have ultimate control. Right. He can say, make this button blue, but if there's a, a poly, a political reason or a localization reason why it can't be blue because we sell in 180 countries, he can't do that. Right. Yeah. So like there was the, there's something about having, that ultimate accountability to say, like, I made this decision and it it's yielded still, this. Still, I will tell you that it takes a lot of courage. What have you learned um, as far as, like, what you would tell your younger self? Would you have left earlier? I would have left earlier. You would have left earlier. Yeah, and not not because I didn't love it there, because I did love it there, mm-hmm. um, but because I, I wish I had taken the leap sooner to go and, and be more accountable earlier. And do you feel happier? Now I'm gone? Yeah. I mean, happier oh. that now you've had that. I mean, you did the radio thing, which we'll talk yeah. about. Yeah, 
that's an accountability right there. Very accountable. Like, you know, <laughs> very, very, very accountable. Happening, not happening. Oh, boy. Yeah. And now you've got this incubator mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. you know, you've also been traveling all over the world, which it sounds like you did a little bit with Microsoft, I did a lot, but you're doing yeah. even more. I'm doing a lot now, too. Yeah. I don't know if I'm happy or not, honestly. It's different. It's just a different kind of yeah, happy. Yeah, it's different happy. And so was Radial, tell us about Radial, what that company did. So Radial is one I, I got plucked out of Microsoft. Uh, so a private equity firm that I was consulting with or doing some work with, they said, hey, look, we bought this company from eBay, not not on eBay, from eBay. Uh, <laughs> for nine ninety nine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like two for like a, about a billion dollars. I bought the company, and it was a. It's the second largest e commerce f- fulfillment company in the nation, behind Amazon. So we powered a c- couple hundred stores. If you're Ralph Lauren or Toys R Us or the Sports Authority or Dick Sporting Goods, we we powered their entire e commerce experience, all the way from the website to the warehouses to the customer service centers. So they bought it from eBay. Uh, and the goal was to basically turn it around and, and make it very successful and sell it. And so uh, I, I ran about half the P&L there, about a, about a gosh, how much was it? About a billion two P&L. So I ran, I ran the technology part of the P&L, and I had a counterpart running the operations part to the warehouses and the people. So yeah, I, I uh, had to get there and figure out what we do. This was technology that was pretty old, frankly, and not well managed and not well written. And the teams were actually pretty good, but they had just had they'd had a, a rotating crop of really terrible CTOs for the last four years under eBay's management, uh, and it was a mess. And so we had to get in there and, and so clean like it a up. little turnaround deal. Yeah. Yeah. And then you sold it. We then sold like two years later. We sold it actually, which is a really really fast sale. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a quick one. It was a quick one. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I know. I was talking to you a little bit more when you were on that, and now I'm just seeing you all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, most of these things have a, most of my travels have a root in uh, work, but then if I'm already going to be there, I'll then pop out for a day or a weekend Seems or something like, like work that. Work and also with Essie, his, his, yeah. who's uh, Stefan's life partner, who's yep. amazing. She, she's like... Far better than I am. She's, she's incredible. Much more interesting than I am, actually, on podcast. She's really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um, with some of her work too, yeah. it seems like. Yeah. Um, so where have you been? Recently, yeah. Let's see. Well, I, I, before we began this, we just we just were in Saudi Arabia, which really you couldn't go to as a tourist until October of last year, which is pretty interesting. Um, we went from there to Azerbaijan, Baku region, which was or the city of Baku, which was absolutely gorgeous, so beautiful. And popped across the Caspian to go to Georgia, Tbilisi, and up north uh, in, in Georgia. Just and what were you doing? Days. What were you doing in Saudi? So in Saudi, we were looking at startups, basically. So I work with a, a group called the Endeavor uh, Group, out of New York, Linda Rottenberg, who, who founded it, and her mission is to incubate high impact entrepreneurs around the world. So they literally go find companies, help them grow. Um, uh, give them support, give them access to resources, mentors, you name it. And about eight times a year, they pull together these companies who have been selected from their their host com- host countries from across the planet into a single location and then bring in a bunch of people like me and usually more qualified than me to review these folks and actually kind of pass them on to be Endeavor entrepreneurs. So anyway, I was in Saudi for that. That's amazing. It was awesome. The, so you, you see such you amazing companies. You must have been companies. so inspired. Are they all like... Um... Any consumer? They're all over the place. They're all over the place. I mean, there's there's a, a enterprise. There's consumer. a scooter company in Turkey, like a bird or a lime, that actually makes money, which is great. <laughs> uh, there's a a bakery, a family-owned bakery that we saw who's scaling out in Saudi to a huge, huge thing. A, a pencil company. Uh, we saw so a, everything, a local, not necessarily these like cloud. not necessarily tech. No, there yeah. were a couple. We had we had an AI uh, Arabic AI conversation engine, which is really really cool. Um, so all really, they ran like I've I've done this now probably six times in different parts of the planet, and the companies are always beyond inspiring. Well, I was going to say you must come back from those. I get so energized, so energized. Yeah, and just even getting I mean, my whole thing is just getting outside of our bubble, right? And yeah. so like th- there are times we've been in places that are pretty uncomfortable. We slept in a, a, a like a chief's. Um, little hut in Fiji a few years ago, and there was no. We're on, I'm on the ground, and there were bugs everywhere, and it was. Yes, he's a vegan, so we couldn't eat any food for the day. And but boy, they were the nicest, most hospitable folks of the entire planet. And we learned a lot just being with those guys yeah. for a couple of days. Oh, what and, you're learning, and I also see that you're taking your daughter on some yeah, of these trips. We definitely are. That's the best she, learning she, ever. Yeah, it's a bummer. She actually was heading out to South Africa for three weeks and two weeks. But now with the with her with the, school, yeah. But now with the virus, that's that's off. So yeah. Uh, so she's going to be in Argentina and Costa Rica for the summer, though, doing medicine down in uh, 
in Argentina for a month, all in Spanish. So we'll see how she does. That's incredible. I hope. We'll see how the virus goes. Yeah, by. I'm just going to call you and be like, okay, what do I do now with my kids? <laughs> now what do I do? Okay, so tell me yeah. about, um, well, the incubator. Yeah. So it's you and you have a partner? I do. Yeah. And you guys are based where? Uh, we're in Chicago. Okay. So it's mostly in Chicago, although she will be transitioning to L.A. starting in September. So it'll be me in Seattle, her in Chicago, and then most of the team who's doing the operational work will be in uh, will be in Chicago. Yeah. So you're yeah. used to this remote work. Yeah, everyone is. I and mean, we have people in New York and L.A. and our devs in L.A. And, and so we're kind of all over the place. You're and, all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And so what does the company do? It's like a typical incubator and sort what's of. the structure? Yeah. It's called 87. Um, and it really is designed to... Uh, either incubate or invest heavily in mostly direct to consumer companies. Mm -hmm. So we got involved in a company called Black Rifle Coffee a couple of years ago, which is a great, great coffee company, veteran owned, veteran run, um, focuses a lot on veteran support. And they went from zero to call it, you know, 80 million bucks in, in a few years. And where are they based? They're in, well, they were in Utah. Now they're in San Antonio and now they're, they're still in San Antonio. Okay. Um, phenomenal group of guys and gals from the company. And so we, we saw how they were able to build a really interesting DDC company by, by focusing on authenticity, great content, humor, education, inspiration. And so we said, let's, let's take that model that they've been so good at doing and see if we can replicate that across other types of verticals. And so that's 87 was born to actually look at and find companies either that we can create from whole cloth or we can we can again buy into and help them grow very very successfully. So you're starting with the idea or you're starting with the person or both? Generally it's the idea. Okay. Well it depends like for, for So you've got some for, ideas brewing right now? Yeah. Oh yeah we have, we're launching a new no one in intended. two weeks. We're launching a new one in two weeks. I can't wait. It's very very exciting. I can't wait. To, I mean you, you'll have to come on the podcast a few The one times. in two weeks. I mean I love the Jetsons. We did Jetson which was the yeah. our first incubation. As We have a Black Rifle, Grounds and Hounds, two coffee companies. We've got Fancy Sprinkles in LA which is a, a, a Phenomenal uh, baking arts company, which is so much fun. It's, she's amazing. Um, Lisa. And so, yeah, so tell us about Jetson, because that's yeah. really, is that where you're spending what percentage of your time? Uh, about right now, 40% of my time is on Jetson. Yeah. Yeah. So Jetson is the world's first seasonal fresh probiotic. Yeah. And it was, the seasonal is the key that's word, That's the right? key, yeah. And fresh, too, because- The fresh we, means it has to be in the fridge? No, no, meaning that we make them, so we, we make them in small batches, which is insane, by the way, to do this, to be very, very clear, because um, it costs you a fortune. Yeah, I was about to say, so it's not so profitable. Right? Well, I mean, prof, how do you define profit? <laughs> profit, schmoffit. <laughs> no, well, I mean, it, it'll actually- Actually, it, yes, it'll be profitable, but it's you're in the growth phase, obviously, the first yeah. nine months. But um, that was this 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 uh, idea that we had because we were looking at the space, and I was looking at my own health, and I've had MS for gosh, almost fourteen plus years now. And when I got diagnosed with it back in the day, the drugs that you were on to fix it were really horrible. They made you feel like you had the flu twenty four seven, and I was like seven years of me shooting up needles on airplanes, as trying to keep the you know keep the disease at bay and keep the pain down, popping pain pills every day. It was awful. So about seven ish years into that journey, I met Mark Hyman, who's a great functional medicine doctor, one of the kind of best ones in the entire country. And he said, "Look, we're going to focus on a few things: your diet, your gut, etc." And within a few weeks of seeing Mark. Uh, I was the pain was gone. I went from taking literally handfuls of pain pills a day to zero in three weeks. That's amazing. Amazing, right? And that's just like green leafy vegetables, it's water. It's shit that we all know we should be doing. Yeah, right? it's lots of leafy greens. It's water. It's sleep. It's movement, and it's your gut. And so the first four things: the the greens, the sleep, the water, the movement. Those are basically You're kind of free ish, yeah. right? You can kind of do them anyway. The gut part's hard, and that's the, what took me the longest in my journey was to get that gut thing down. And so. Um, that's where we focus on Jetson. We said, how can I find clinical strains of bacteria that have actual studies behind them that have proven efficacy in certain areas? How can we actually put those into a seasonal pill so once every quarter the formulation changes and get them out directly to consumers' hands so they can have the same, hopefully, some experience I had in helping them repair their, their health? So that's how it was born. Um, and so would it, pretend I yeah. order it. After, because I probably will. Yes. So what do I do? I now take it. Is it a? It's a pill. It's a pill. And I take yeah. it every morning. Every, or yeah. Every, and I keep it in the fridge. You don't have to, but we recommend it. But it's doesn't. It's up to about eighty degrees. It's totally fine. But, and um, do you notice it? Would I notice a difference you, if I don't have MS? What oh, else yeah. does it yeah, help yeah, yeah. with? Oh gosh. So that your, the gut actually. This is the cool thing. Gut health is. I, I swear to you, in five years, will be this thing that everyone realizes. It's like has. cigarettes, type of thing. Like 
Like, y- yeah, but, you know, like but, we look but back in a good way. Yeah, no, no, exactly. like on the positive yeah. way. We're like, how did we not know? <laughs> it's like know? smoking. That's like, right. how did we? Uh, yeah, not, yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, where you're like, oh, it was normal to not be talking about it, and suddenly it's like, how did we not? Everyone, how are we not focused on this as our top? I mean, a few interesting things. Eighty percent of your immune system is actually in your gut. You know, eighty-five percent of your serotonin, which is your mental health, is in is produced in your gut. The fact that if your gut is permeable, if the gut actually isn't isn't properly functioning pathogens, bad bacteria can escape out of that gut, move into your bloodstream and cause whole body inflammation. Like we are now seeing whole body inflammation being tied to all sorts of cancers, all sorts yes. of other conditions, uh, other immune diseases. Like the gut, that's where it starts. That's actually where a lot of this starts. Yeah. So yes, you'll notice a difference because we actually use strains that have, again, studies behind them to show this can help with you can't say things like allergies, but it'll help with like rhinitis, which is pollen in the yeah. air. It'll help with um, body composition. It'll help with immunity. It'll help with heart health. There are actual, we know this bacteria in this concentration in a body has this effect on people. So I'm so excited. It's really cool. Like I, I'm I, so I love excited. the product. It's one of my favorite products I've ever built for sure. Well, of course. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. And so, what's the what's the goal with it? And then, and how are you funding all of this? Where is the money coming from? Uh, Kickstarter. No, I'm kidding. Uh, so, I'll take two dollars. <laughs> how much do you pay for this? Uh, no, so we we are we're lucky to have as part of 87. We're part of a, a we were kind of a, a spinoff of a larger private equity firm uh, called Sterling Partners back in Chicago, and the four partners behind that one really have have done quite well for themselves, and the firm's done quite well. So they actually. They are they're the seed capital for all these companies, basically. Well, that's super exciting. Yeah. Are you trying to grow it? Yeah. Pretty big. Yeah. No, this thing is we have a we have big aspirations. We launched our first kids product today, so now we have a kids probiotic out there, which is a powder form, so you can hide it in their food that they don't even know what's happening. Um, oh, that's and amazing. And that has great clinicals too. So yeah. And so, um, so the kids are going to be taking Jetson, and they're going to. It's called about... Jetty. Jetty. The kids product is the Jetty. kids one's called Jetty. Yeah. Okay, but the name is cool too. Jetson's cool. Isn't Jetson's it? like yeah, I feel like I'm like doing something cool. Good. <laughs> that's the idea. The name sounds maybe it's like the Jetsons. I don't know. I, I can't comment the on future. that. Because, uh, <laughs> the future of gut health. But, but certainly, we just thought it was a great sounding name. It yeah. had that kind of that that, that notion of of uh, of something different. Right. Yeah. Most of the brands out there are pretty lame. For, yeah. For no, I can see that, and I don't know enough about this. And you're definitely a friend that I would call to be. Like, okay. Now, what do I do? You're gonna like them. I'm excited. I know. I'll, I'll see you, and I'll be like, I'm a whole new person. <laughs> You might be. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about it before the podcast, like Dan Levitan specifically. Like, mm-hmm. w- what do you do to set yourself up for a good week, especially when you're traveling? How do you not feel out of balance? <laughs> uh, part of it is is c- completely mental, like just not letting time zones get in your way. That's the first thing. The second thing is I do sleep. Like I, you love I, sleep. I don't love it. I'm religious about it. I need seven hours a night minimum, and I, I usually get exactly seven. That's kind of my, my, my bar. But I will be – I will – I will leave parties early. I will you prioritize schedule. your sleep. Got to have sleep. Sleep is literally yeah. two hour decline in sleep can make you like you're drunk the next day as far as mental acuity is concerned. So really sleep so, so important to me. Um, and then as far as like setting up on a Sunday for a Monday, I mean, again, I, I am uh, I am very I, I covet my my reading and my and my time to read. And so having Pocket, for example, the app I mentioned earlier, queuing up my stories all week long and I'll spend time on a Sunday kind of just getting my brain into a different space. So I don't just, because you can easily crash in a Monday yeah. and be reactionary, right? Oh, and totally. just be like- I think I, most people do. Right, which is, and I, 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 I of course do sometimes as well. Yeah. But I like to be more planful and thoughtful and, and get my brain to be a, in a different space so I can have the ideas that I otherwise wouldn't have if I just simply- crashed into the week and yeah. started taking meetings first thing Monday morning. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of a lot of planning. I have a great uh, assistant who is great at the calendars. And, and so uh, a lot of planning to make sure I don't end up... And probably planning food, too, I'm guessing. Lots of food planning. Yeah. You have to. If you're gonna... I do. And I, like, I'm, trying, I'm flying out in a few hours after this and uh, making sure when I land in Chicago, everything's there in my fridge that I need. And even on the planes, having the right food with me. Yeah. Uh, I'm not like a... I'm not, I mean, I will. You're eat, not crazy. I will eat crappy plain food if I have to. Trust me, I've done it before. Um, but generally, I'll have the, all the food kit with me with pistachios and almonds and a, a grass-fed beef stick and you know some uh, some green juice. And you can t- you'd be shocked what you can get through TSA these days. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Green juice you can't, but it, but uh, but ice packs super easy. All right. Yeah. I, I'm, I always learn from you. I always love when I'm around you. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take notes, take more notes, take more notes. And that's why I wanted you on the podcast because yeah, I wanted you to fun. share like all of your wisdom. The with hacks. Everybody. Yeah. All the hacks. And then we'll get, have you back on again. The next like, okay. the next company in two weeks is next level. I can't wait to hear it's, about it. It's really So fun. what would you say like ultimately fuels you? 
Like if you, your legacy for your daughter and kind of oh for the world. Oh, my gosh. It's a big uh, one. It is. Uh, mic drop. Mic, mic drop. You know, I, I talk with my therapist about that all, this all the time, actually. <laughs> you put pressure on yourself, I'm sure. I, I do. And, and he's like, well, you're already, you know, you've done a lot. Like, yeah, you, you should have. be pretty happy. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm never I'm never that happy about like, Most where people I'm that are worthy yeah. of something. Of, of this mean. podcast no, are worthy not just of, happy. Just worthy of just, you know, I think that that's a good thing. Yeah. And so not think, to be unhappy, but to no, have no, no, like no, a no. little, we call it spilkas. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. Yes, a little exactly. bit like, I need more, more, more. I need a little bit more. And so I think my the legacy I want to leave, especially with these these next few, like I only have a few companies left to me because they're, they're frankly pretty hard to build. And like 3 a.m. last time we're pushing code to places. I'm pretty tired. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it's it's got to be to to I don't know. It sounds so so cliche, but to leave this place better than I found it, and I, I think with the ones we're doing right now, I think we can actually do that. So, like my daughter, I want her to just to be. I want my daughter to look at me and say, "That's that's my father." Like, look at that guy. What I think she, did? or I know she already does. I don't know. But I know what you're saying. I, I get the eye rolls quite often these days. Well, she's that age. Are you <laughs> no, kidding? She's awesome. I got times three. I got six oh, eye rolls I coming can't at me. Even, um, and David, so. I roll, and my husband's <laughs> also eye rolling. I know. I yelled out the window as I was dropping my daughter off because she's like, Mom, Mom, stop. Like my nine year old. And I dropped her off this morning. I was like, Bye. Rolling down the window. Oh, yeah. Screaming at her just oh, to yeah. embarrass her. I do too. Yeah. I'm like, this is so funny. And you wonder why the eye roll at us. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the What Fuels You podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest news and episodes. You can also contact us at podcast at fueltalent.com to provide feedback, ask questions, and share topics or guests you would like us to cover in the future. We hope you feel inspired by our guests and that we have helped fuel your day. Join us next time for another episode of What Fuels You. Thank you.